Excellent. I'll be right back. about, um, or I got somebody's email about 
their presentation. Was that one of you two? Okay. And I emailed you back about that, so hopefully you got that. Last time uh, we we uh, talked about the beginning of this project. Did you get the email that I sent with the paperwork for the project with that research guide? Yeah. Good. Um, the video that I took last week did not work for some reason. And I'm hoping that this one's working today. It looks like it's going. But I want to go over that sheet one more time really quick just because it didn't record last time. So we'll spend a little bit of time kind of reviewing what we did last week and talking about trebuchets again. So let me open that up. information, background information, both on history, ideas, um, and the science behind the trebuchets, the engineering behind trebuchets. And they've got this nice big picture of a trebuchet on the front page of this, which is nice. It uh, follows the French design. They even built it with old materials, handmade wood planks and other things like this. But the idea of the trebuchet is uh, to throw things like a catapult without having the tension in the machine like a catapult has. A catapult uses skeins of leather and twisted rawhide and whatever else. You can use elastic materials of any kind. And it uses those elastic materials to, to throw materials, whereas a, to throw a, a projectile where a trebuchet is using a fulcrum arm or a lever arm with a mass on one end on the short end of the arm and the sling on the other end of the arm, and of course your projectile inside that sling. And it's something that can be used again and again and again, and it turns out that it can be used not only more times than a, than a catapult, but it also can throw further than a catapult, throw things faster than a catapult. So it's a much better weapon in the end. Here they show some close-up schematics of this particular design. And I pointed out last time that you can see that this basket on the end of the sling here has several different holes so that you can attach this basket in different places and make the sling longer or shorter. And depending on what you're throwing, you want to make it longer or shorter. And uh, so for a bigger thing, you want to make it shorter so that the sling is bigger, so that the basket is bigger. Uh, for smaller things, you make the sling longer and it will throw those smaller things faster and further. And uh, over here they show, they show some parts right here. They're showing this. They're showing a close-up of this part here, which is the release mechanism. This pulley, this pulley system down here cranks down the arm, lifts up this mass in the process, and there's a pin between the bottom part of the pulley system and the top part, which is connected to the trebuchet, and that pin is the firing pin. When you pull that pin out, that is what fires the trebuchet or releases the, the potential energy of the trebuchet. On most of the trebuchets that my students have built, they don't build in a pulley system because they don't need to. So we're building a small size trebuchet, we're throwing a ping pong ball. And so it does not require that you have a pulley system to, to crank this thing around. They just pull it down with their hand and they put a little, some kind of pin in it or something. Some of, them, some of my students even just held it down with their hand and released it with their hand, and that's fine too. So in this next section, they go into the physics of trebuchets. They talk a lot about levers and how the different distances between uh, the load and the effort or the load and the floor applied force from the fulcrum leads to different forces at each end. So you have a small force applied here, and you get a big force applied here. And the, uh, the opposite is also true. You can apply a big force here and get a small force here. However, the difference being 
is that if you apply a big force here, and this moves a little bit of distance, this one over here that gives a small force moves a lot of distance. And that's really what the trebuchet takes advantage of, is this uh, very fast movement on this end for a very small movement on this end, a very short movement on this end. And they're, sh they're showing kind of the opposite. They talk about the different ways that we use this in tools like hammers and scissors and other things. They talk about a different lever where both the effort and the load are on the same side. And other machines are going to use that in the uh, stapler, the wheelbarrow. And then the third class lever where the load is outside of the effort but the fulcrum is still on the end. So they're just giving a physic, basic physics of levers where, where, where this is used. And the arm is actually a, a type of this third class lever, the broom, hockey stick, so on and so forth. So which one is the trebuchet? It's, of course, the first class lever. And on the end of the lever, we put in a sling, which essentially extends the length of that long end of the lever. And it also, uh, since it's flexible, it also swings things around and allows the, the uh, projectile to get even faster than it would otherwise. And that's really what you're looking for, is something that's very fast. Here's another one of these big French style siege engine. This one's built on wheels so that it will roll as it as it throws. And it turns out that letting the letting the trebuchet roll back and forth as it throws is very advantageous. It actually makes it more efficient. It also makes it a little more complex. And complex machines are you know more likely to break, more difficult to get right. So you have to kind of do a trade-off between complexity and, and whether or not it's going to work. Here's a very simple one, and it's obviously not very big. It's made of probably some two by fours here, and it's got a sling on the end, and it's got a mass on this end. You can't even see the mass really in this picture, but it's there. Um, well, the counterweight is, it says the counterweight is Zach. Somebody is on this thing, really. Oh, he's pulling it. He's behind it. So he's actually just pulling it with his hands. But I guess that works, too. So here is the basic design of the trebuchet, very simplified. Your mass on one end, your fulcrum here, somewhere between the mass and the arm, but the arm, the throwing arm much longer, and the sling, which usually starts out below the mass down the, the mass down here underneath the trebuchet. <clears throat> and this allows the maximum movement of the of the projectile and gives it the, the most opportunity to be accelerated through its fastest speed. Of course, the one thing we haven't talked about yet is the connection right here. The connection right here is usually some kind of hook that can that uh, can be varied. The angle of the hook can be varied because at some part of the motion here, at some part of this swinging motion, the sling is going to slip off that hook. One end of the sling is connected permanently to the, the lever arm. The other end is just looped over this hook that's at a particular angle so that it releases at a particular angle. And it turns out that there is an angle that is ideal for releasing this thing. Here they show it having released, having been released. Another thing that they show in this diagram, which is nice, is they show the swinging arm mass on, on this trebuchet. If you can get the swinging arm mass on the trebuchet balanced just right and shaped just right so that it swings at just the right moment, it will be a very good design. If you can't, it actually takes energy out of your trebuchet. We had that problem a couple of years ago with some of my students who built a trebuchet that, where the, the swinging mass would swing at the wrong time right before this thing was, was releasing. So right before the uh, mass, the, the projectile was released from the sling, this thing was swinging the wrong way and it stopped the lever arm so that the mass all of a sudden wasn't going very fast anymore. So you need, to, you need to kind of balance it out and you need to be able to test it. That means that several things on this lever arm need to be adjustable. You need to be able to adjust where the fulcrum is. So maybe have several different holes in your fulcrum or whatever else is considered, you know, determined depending on how you're going to design this. You just have to have that adjustable somehow, somewhat because you may have to make some adjustments to make this thing ideal. You might want to have the swinging arm length here adjustable if you're having a swinging arm mass. If you're just having a fixed mass, you won't have to worry about that. <clears throat> but you might want to be able to adjust how much mass you put on here. 
the amount of mass can affect this as well. And then, of course, the length on this end is adjustable when you adjust this fulcrum, but you can also make it adjustable at the, at the far end. And I've had students that make that adjustable as well. But the length of the sling should be adjustable and the hook should be adjustable for the angle. All of those things you should be able to change while you're testing it uh, pretty easily so that you don't have to rebuild the whole thing if, the thing if it's just not working out. And that often happens with trebuchets. It's kind of like fine-tuning a uh, violin or something. You gotta kind of tweak it around and, and play it and play with it and see if it works and then tweak it around a little bit more. <clears throat> so in this part they actually go through the mathematics of torque and torque is a force, a torque is essentially a force that causes a rotation or a desire to rotate um, in an object and of course trebuchets are obviously rotating so there are obviously torques involved and the idea is that the torque on each end of the trebuchet is the same. Let me see if I can find the equation that I want to show you for that. I was looking for it last time and never found it. I don't think. This is essentially the, uh, the equation. <coughs> Excuse me. So a torque, the torque is equal to a force, which is the F times a distance R, and the sine of theta ends up becoming 1 for 90 degrees for most situations that we're going to deal with. And so it's just your torque is equaling distance times force. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and if the torque has to be the same on either side of the fulcrum, and the distance is from the force to the fulcrum, then if you have a longer distance or a bigger R, then you're going to have a smaller force. And if you have a smaller R, you're going to have to have a bigger force for those torques to be the same. And that's the equation that shows that idea. Of course, you don't need to know necessarily any of those, that science in, in mathematical terms to do this project but it might be interesting for you. You can use it if you'd like. So, let's see here. Here they, they're just doing some more math again. And like I said, you don't have to fill out the mechanical advantage tables if you don't want to. Um, not a bad idea to learn more about that, but it's kind of up to you since this class is not supposed to involve mathematics in great detail, so we're not going to get into these things. But, I'm trying to get to the, get through this all so that we make sure we don't miss anything. Yeah, the rest of the, oh, so here's the last part that I wanted to talk about. That's the idea of projectile motion. In projectile motion, you essentially have two-dimensional motion. You have motion horizontally and motion vertically, right? So if you have a ball that's being thrown up into the air, it not only moves up and then down again, right, but it also moves forward. So that's two-dimensional motion. And with projectiles, two-dimensional two -dimensional motion always ends up being some kind of modified parabola. And that is assuming there's no wind resistance. There will always be some kind of resistance, but uh, that's where the modify, modification comes in. But because we always get the same kind of the same kind of uh, path, this this parabolic path, there is a mathematical ideal, mathematically ideal situation for the projectile. In other words, there's an ideal angle to release it at. And most people would probably say, well, it's probably 45 degrees, right in the middle. And it turns out that in ideal situations, that's not a bad idea. It's not a bad thing. But in less than ideal situations, with air resistance, for example, you want to have a slightly shallower angle or less, for, less than 45 degrees. So 45 degrees, of course, would be right here in the middle of this to shoot this projectile off this way. But ideally, you want a little bit less than 45. You want to get a little bit more horizontal motion to try to overcome some of the air resistance that's going to prevent the forward motion of your projectile. So 45 degrees or less, I would, I would try to aim your, or try to adjust your, your trebuchet so that you're shooting probably somewhere between 35 and 45 degrees, 50 degrees at the most, um, and just play with it and see what works. It all depends. It depends on a lot of different conditions. So you may end up getting an angle that's maybe even more than 50, 45 degrees that works best for your particular trebuchet. 
just because there are lots of factors involved with the with the movement of the trebuchet. And then they have a bunch of practice problems here that I'm not asking you to do either. And then the questions about um, building your trebuchet, the things you should you should consider. So. Setting the angle of the prong or the hook, right? A more hooked prong will hold the sling loop longer than a straighter one. So keep that in mind. If you bend the hook more, it's going to hang on to the sling longer. In other words, the trebuchet will rotate around further and you'll be throwing flatter. And if it's too hooked, you may just throw it right into the ground right in front of your trebuchet. You may never let go of it. So um, a, lot of, a um, less hooked or less bent hook will give you an earlier release or a higher trajectory and a more hooked will give you more forward pointing or a flatter trajectory. The length of the cord that holds the sling pouch, right? A shorter sling will rotate faster than a long sling, right? And long slings will give you slow sling rotation and a later release and a flatter trajectory. So shorter ones will give you a higher trajectory again. Those things can affect two things. They can affect the speed of the, of the projectile and they can also affect the trajectory of the projectile. Right. So the, the other thing that they also uh, will affect is the shorter slings will do better for heavier masses and um, they will speed them up better. The longer slings, even though they have a slow rotation at the beginning, at the end will have a longer, will have a faster speed for lighter materials. And I'm not mentioning that here, but that is true. So in here they talk about heavy projectiles and light projectiles. You're not necessarily going to get to choose it because we're throwing ping pong balls, but it's not a bad idea to realize that heavier projectiles get a higher trajectory and light projectiles get a flatter trajectory. So, we've got those three things to consider, and that is the end of the trebuchet curriculum sheet. Kind of this sheet that's going to give you an idea of how to search for ideas, what things to consider as you're, as you're designing and as you're building. Just to give us just a few things to get you started. Any questions about that? Again? Okay. Whew, we got to do that again. Now we're ready to get started with this project. So, finish up your research. Get started on some alternative designs, get started on evaluating <coughs> your alternative designs, and then um, choose a fun, uh, alternative design for your final design and create your final design for the prototype. Now, today we are supposed to be giving some presentations. Now, I don't know how, what kind of uh, tools we have at your end for giving presentations. I assume there's a computer in the room since there's a projector in the room. Can you access the computer in the room and put your presentations up on the screen there? Or no? Okay.
All right, what are you guys seeing on your screen now? Are you seeing yourselves? Okay. That's what I want. I'm, uh, that's exactly what I want, because I want to be able to see the PowerPoint on my video, so I think that's the only way to do it, really. I'm going to step out for just a minute, and I'll be right back. Okay, we got it working yet? I can see the students. That's all I can see so far. No, I can't see. No, I can't. I can see the desks in the classroom and all of you sitting at them. control over what I see from your end. All I, all I can do is show you. I, I can only control what I'm sending to you. So, yeah, I can just see the students there. Okay, I can see I can see in one corner of my screen a smaller screen that says bridge project. So that's and then it disappears. Why don't you why don't you just tilt tilt your camera up towards the back of the room because it's on the back screen in your room. And I can see that one. That's good enough. Now it's gone. There we go. Just zoom in on that back right screen and we'll call it good. That is good. Excellent. Sounds good to me. That is good. That's fine. Thank you.
I can see just fine. Go ahead whenever you're ready.
Thank you, Kevin. Good job. All right, Kyle, are you ready to do this? We're ready.
Okay, thank you, Kyle. I know you guys got to head out to your next class, so I'll let you do that. I will try to get a recording from our uh, other students to see if we can get uh, so show you their presentations, and then we'll post these to YouTube. So you guys have a good day, and we'll see you Monday.